and we're live. Hello everyone, DBT and schema therapy, frenemies or love at first sight. My name's Tenna Davies. I'm a clinical psychologist and advanced certified schema therapist. And I've got a very special guest on tonight, Chris Hempworth, not Hemsworth. And he's a, an advanced certified schema therapist, supervisor and trainer. Welcome, Chris. What have you got to tell us about this power couple? If they're a power couple, first of all. Look, I, I think they are. I think they can be very, very complimentary. And, and it was definitely very early on in my career. I actually think that they really complement each other's, not weaknesses, but maybe the stuff they don't do, in my opinion, as, as strongly. They compensate for each other. They can't, but they don't overcompensate. They just <laughs> no, 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 never. Yes. Well, yeah, and I think one of the things we particularly we've looking at is in when is DBT helpful in schema therapy? is I would remember a lot of the textbooks kind of when I was first studying might have a line or two that said, you know, an upskilled people as necessary, you know, and in, a, in amongst doing your imagery and, you know, kind of whatever it would be, it was kind of like an, and teach skills, upskill as necessary. Yeah. And kind of going, and, and how do I do that? What's that? Yeah. It, it's like um, one of those um, generic, vague kinds of things like continue to monitor, yeah. but what does this actually mean? Yeah. Mm. So I, th and I think that's really where the DBT skills, at least, because obviously DBT is an entire framework and, and there is, you know, really good reasons at times why the fidelity is really important and stick to the whole, you know, gambit when you really need to. But I think it's the skills from DBT that actually can be really beneficial in schema therapy. Um, plus, one of the other things I tell people is actually the whole idea of dialectics, because basically like it's a fancy word for balance. And ultimately, that's that's what you're trying to achieve in schema therapy, you're trying to get people's schemas to be more balanced, not be black and white, not be either my needs not important or, you know, entitlement, my needs are the only thing that are important, but actually get balance in between. Mm. So I also think that the word and, so to speak, from DBT is actually very helpful in that kind of like stylistic element. Yeah. I love that. That's very true. Yeah. Oh, look, I've heard kind of like Wendy Bahari say a few times, although she also talks about this sometimes, oh, you have to give somebody a really good but, as in when you do an empathic confrontation, you have to go, but you can't talk to me that way. But I think a lot of the time it can be that use of the word and, like I really get why you're talking to me like this when you were younger, et cetera. And though when you do this, it pushes people away and it's not helpful for you. So I do think it's a stylistic stuff, but all of it's about the skills. I think DBT teaches skills incredibly well. And, you know, you, even as healthy adults, if you think about it, we really use a lot of skills, whether it's just kind of like regulate our emotions, tolerate distress, or even just how to have kind of a conversation with someone and like kind of be assertive or be soft in it. But hopefully, you know, as a healthy adult, we've learned a lot of those skills quite naturally, or at least just like the good enough kind of skills. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of our clients won't necessarily have got that. And even if they they really overall do well enough, say with the motion regulation, um, it's absolutely times what will benefit from being taught an extra thing that they haven't picked up and stuff like that. Yeah, it's like giving them the, the, the tools and the resources to operationalize some of these things. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think part of that as well is, you know, that we also want them to be, as well as the therapeutic relationship, we also want them to be look after the, themselves to kind of knowing how they can do things outside a session too, but when we're not there, I think is really helpful with that. Um, and, and what are some of your favorite, you know, ways that uh, DBT and schema therapy, you know, where they really come together and they're the absolute best of friends? So I think it's probably what you would call like the crisis survival skills It's probably the skills that I would teach people the most when I'm doing schema therapy with them, because they're, they're your real kind of like calm the farm or, you know, kind of like learn how to tread water and bring things down when they're too much kind of skills. Um, and in particular, there's one called stop, which actually, like if you said to me, you've got an hour with somebody and you have to teach them DBT skills, what would you teach them? Stop would be one of them. And the other one would be something called opposite action. Um, so we, we've stopped because that's really about impulsivity and um, so stuff like anger. So that's really handy for like your angry child mode or someone's about to kind of do something self-destructive because it's all about kind of like putting the brakes on and not reacting. 
And in a broader sense as well, I actually think that the stop skill as a broader concept is really important because actually if you're going to go in from reacting to changing any habitual behavior, so that's kind of like surrendering to our schemas, doing what they tell us to do, surrendering to those kind of like critical modes, you've actually first got to pause and realize you're about to do that and then take a step back and instead realize you maybe got a choice and it could be a healthier thing to do. Yeah, that's right. It's like a necessary, it's like a necessary but not sufficient condition, but they, they still need to pause. Yeah, exactly. So it's, like it's in that order kind to of benefit like, oh. from, from schema. Yes. Yeah. So look, the start one would be one that I teach people quite frequently. And it doesn't have to take a long time. And what one of the things with that though that I find really important to people is you're actually thinking about which mode though you're teaching the skills to. Mm, that's very yeah. interesting. What you, what you can do, and I, I often tell people that you can use the skills for good or for evil, or, you know, I kind of talk about Star Wars and you've got the light side of the force and the dark side of the force. Because <laughs> this is one of the other things, even though I think they, they marry really well together, I also talk to people about, but you don't just want to go teaching people skills left, right and center. Like actually, you know, what overcompensation and things like detachment and avoidance love skills. You know, you could skill them to high heaven. It helps them not necessarily be feeling, helps them get on top of stuff. So it's kind of about which which mode are you teaching the skills to and why? Because you always want to be teaching it's that healthy adult mode and you're kind of like bolstering the, the healthy adult's armor with the skills. Yes, rather than enabling some of those coping modes. You know, that's interesting because I have very much had the experience that's... Um, t- teaching skills to clients can sometimes ironically make things worse. Yeah. Well, the, the couple that I've had about that, a couple that I guess come up more frequently or people tell me about and say, well, what happens when this happens? One is where you get people who've gone from, and it, and it ends up, I guess, like being an overcompensation, what people say with subjugation or maybe self-sacrifice who are quite passive. And then you teach them some assertiveness skills. And they're actually going around, as I would then say now, like sledgehammering people left, right and centre. <laughs> yeah. You've, you've got to tell them to rein back a little bit now. It's kind of like you're going from one to the other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the pendulum has swung the other way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's always um, an uh-oh moment in therapy, isn't it? Where you're like, yeah. oh, what have I done? Yeah, you know, I've created a monster. <laughs> um, but I, th- I think with that, even with that, it's kind of like just normalising it. Look, we all... Kind of make sometimes when we learn something new, we go a bit too far. This is maybe how to use it next time, or this is what more the healthy adult version of it is. Because remember, other people still have rights and needs to, not just, you know, it's about us now. Um, so I think that's actually one of the really big ones is just kind of going like it needs to be for that healthy adult mode. And what I always kind of say to people is explain why you're teaching that skill as well. So I might say, look, I'm going to teach you the stop skill. So the next time that kind of fireball, angry party, the angry child or whatever it is, is about to come out and roast somebody, your healthy adult can learn to put the brakes on and actually take a step back and deal with it in a healthier manner instead. So just being really clear in a way why you're teaching it within the scheme of therapy framework. It's, there's a lot more useful in that sense. Yeah, that you're basically just um, skilling up the healthy adult. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Rather than learn, teaching the detached protector how to actually avoid feelings more by giving distraction techniques and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, yeah, sorry, go on. No, no, no. I was just going to say how, I mean, that makes complete sense, but how do, how does therapists make sure that they're not teaching the detached protector things, you know, because sometimes the detached protector can masquerade quite, quite well as a, make itself look like a healthy adult. I think one of the rules of form is, because I, I often say to people, it'd be lovely if people walked into a session with, say, a couple of letters on their head. So when you use motor <laughs> like HA or something like that, they're in healthy adult today. Um, or or, the- or if, if a little rotating sign, so as they do mode flips, you're like, ah, I see what's happening here. That, that's that's uh, what I would be, you know, I'd be paying for an app for that for sure. Yeah, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't show it them now, so we could just look really clever. Um, but completely... Well, I think one of them is if someone is using a skill way too much, that's a little bit of a red flag of, look, these skills have certain intentions and certain places where they're useful. So, you know, but I'm noticing you're using that like all the time. And 
Because with that, I remember one client who I taught tip to, tip to, which basically is a lot of physical skills to help calm your body down. Um, like diaphragmatic breathing is one of the pieces, like the pace breathing and stuff like that. All stuff that physiologically helps you calm down. And I realized after a few sessions that pretty much any time they had a feeling, they were just going for a run. They were doing the intense exercise. And it was, wasn't was that actually they were that overwhelmed that they needed to take the edge off to then come back and healthy adult and deal with the feeling. It's kind of like they were literally running away from the feeling. Yeah, that's interesting. So I guess would one of the things that you need to do is when you teach people this, be in, in your own mind assessing what mode um, performed the, the tip or the stop or the strategies. Yeah. And if I kind of like, if I spot particularly with someone that there's a certain mode that might try and hijack it, like say the detached protector or the avoidant protector instead of the healthy adult kind of like using, say, distraction for distancing, I'll tell them about it and I'll actually explain what the difference is so that when they then come back, you can kind of cock your head a little bit and go, so do you think you use that skill more for like, you know, healthy adult distancing or was it more like kind of avoidance going up here? I actually find that when you teach people that you'd let them kind of like start to know what the difference is. A lot of people can actually own it and go, well, you know what, maybe there was some avoidance in there, but I honestly think a lot of it was healthy adult or whatever it may be. So, yeah, it's a spectrum. And I like how you set that up, um, like preset that up so Mm. so that you're, you're able to have that conversation with the client afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that is one of the big ones, but Apart from that, it is just about frequency. People are using it all the time. It's probably kind of going, okay, there's bound to be times you're misusing or overusing this particular skill. Um, but the, I think the other one is just like the intention. I really think about and what, what was your intention, you know, when doing that skill? What was that part of you? What was that intention when you put that out there? Um, and then I think the intention can tell a lot between the moments as well. Yeah, that's that's a really good point all around. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Mm, okay. anything else that um people that you think would be really important for people to know when implementing dbt and schema therapy any sort of pitfalls i think i think that actually probably would hopefully cover a lot of the pitfalls is that actually kind of like knowing why you're teaching someone the skill i actually think that that's the biggest one mm. and and in that sense as well if you decide because the way i often teach it people is there's two ways i'm going to do it I'm either going to go essentially let's for the next few second sessions spend a block of sessions on teaching your skills. So it's quite clear we're working on assertiveness skills for the next few sessions. I'm going to teach you this stuff. Um, or what I more frequently do is use it ad hoc. So I actually kind of, you know, when you've, you've come in and you've attuned, you know, you found out what's been going on in the week, almost like that middle third, when you found out what's going on and then you're given the options. So you're going, look, today we could look at some imagery with scripting. It's actually knowing that your, your work for the session can be the skills. Hmm. So actually kind of like, if you really think it is worth it for people, if you feel like, say, teaching the stop skills to help people put the brakes on when they're an angry child, it's like, don't, don't just give that the two minute version then. Actually kind of like, slow down and take the time in the session to explain it and work it through with them with one of their mode or schema examples so they know how that would have worked say in the situation they've just brought to you for that session and maybe even how it's going to go forward so i think that's one of the big ones it's not just about knowing who you're teaching the skills to and why but really like honoring it so it is like and this is important this is useful rather than the here's a handout for for two minutes or five minutes yeah and and I think what you're also saying is give it space, you know, that, that it has legitimate um, airtime and space in the session. Yes, exactly. Because exactly. I think I think those of us that are really, you know, passionate about schema therapy, we can get a little bit like, oh, but we're not doing schema, so we, we better do it quickly. We better do the oh, skills. Okay, here's five minutes on skills, but it's completely leg- legitimate to do skills work as well. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I, I have my demanding schema therapist voice who will be like, you didn't do imagery that session. Not a very good schema therapist. Like, yeah, yeah, thanks for that. How could you? I know. <laughs> How dare I? Yeah. yeah, I know. I think we all I think we all have that part of us, don't we? Yeah. Well, you've you've taught us so many interesting things, um, or, or pointed out so many interesting ways of using DBT and schema therapy. So mm. thank you. Thank you. I understand you've got some a workshop coming up. 
Yeah, look, so with, you know, COVID and all that happened, the way that the world made us all turn to telehealth, um, I now do teach it as, as part of a, you know, self-paced um, online course where you can learn about what all the different DBT skills are and how to integrate them within that schema therapy framework. Uh, so we do we do have the next one coming up. I think the, it's the 30th of August is the next intake. And so that is kind of six weeks. There's lots of videos of me showing how I actually teach the skills, like kind of client examples with a colleague of mine who played a particular client for me. Um, yeah, so that, that's coming up on the 30th of August is the next one. Um, and that schema therapy training online, you can kind of go and, and register for that. Lovely. And I'll um, put the uh, link in the comments. Well, Thank thanks so much, Chris. What a treat. And no doubt we'll speak to you again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks.